So, back in the 1970s, my mom was a teenager living in Houston. She and her nine siblings lived in the Heights, which she says is a nice neighborhood now, but at the teeth was something of a slum. Her family was super, super poor. Anyway, my mom had a crush on one of her brother's friends. She was around 14 or 15 at the time. He was a few years older, but she was in love. His name was Mark. Well, around this time, boys started disappearing from the neighborhood. They weren't leaving notes or telling anyone that they were leaving. The families were calling the police, but the police weren't doing anything about it. They decided that the boys had run away, and never really looked into it further. After all, these were poor kids living in a bad neighborhood, they ran away all the time. Life goes on. One day, Mark disappears too. Meanwhile, my mom's younger brother is hitching a ride out to the beach to go fishing. He did this on a regular basis, and would bum a ride from anyone. On the way to the beach, the guy driving the car stops to fill up the gas tank. The guy working at the gas station, mom says they called him Weird Larry, sees my uncle and asks who he's with. My uncle replies that he doesn't actually know the guy. Larry won't let my uncle go any further and makes him get out of the car. The driver goes on without him. Three years have passed since the boys started disappearing, and they finally find out what happened. A man had been paying two boys to lure teenage boys to his house, where he drugged them, strapped them to a wooden board, tortured them, raped them, and killed them. There were at least 28 victims, and Mark Scott was one of them. The only reason they found out was because the two teenagers murdered the serial killer, who then told the police about all of the murders and led them to some of the bodies. And guess who picked up my uncle that day he was going fishing? Then there was this one R.L. Stein story that always freaked me out. I'll make up names and try to tell you the gist of it. There was this kid named Jerry who had to go to the hospital to have his tonsils out, so he's staying in a room with a few other beds. There's a kid in the bed next to him called Ben but whenever someone calls him by his name he says I'm not Ben. Ben's mum tells Jerry it's because Ben has to have his leg amputated and he does not want to lose it. On the night of Ben's surgery, the nurses come in to will Ben to the operating room, but they approach Jerry's bed. Ah the chart here says Ben says the nurse and they start wheeling off Jerry. Jerry says but I'm not Ben. The nurse then says to the other oh he always says that apparently. Jerry then looks over to Ben's bed where Ben is sitting smiling. This story takes place in Flushing, Queens, New York. For those of you familiar with the area, it's a house between the big cemetery and Queens College. About two years ago, I lived in a pretty nice house. It had three rooms, a full kitchen, and an attic for only $1,300 a month. For all of you who rent apartments, you'd know this is a damn good deal. A large cemetery was about six to seven blocks away, but it really has nothing to do with my story. Anyway, after moving all of my stuff into my new place, I started to explore. All the rooms, all the nooks and crannies and whatnot. I noticed that the room I chose, I let my mom have the larger room. Yes, I live with my mom. Go F yourself, had a small piece of paper above the door. It was placed flat on the wall between the top of the door and the ceiling. All that was on the paper was a few Chinese letters. Now, I'm Chinese, but I can't read Chinese for poo, so I had no idea what it said, but I have seen those types of paper before. Basically, there are old traditions about monsters, usually vampires, that have a piece of paper attached to their head, hat, or whatever. Google Chinese vampires and look at some of the pictures. 
That's what this paper above my door looked like. I asked my landlord, a semi old white lady, about it. She said that the last guy to live in the house was very superstitious. So I brushed it off. I left that paper there, though, because, seriously, who wants to mess with something like that? My room had a very deep closet. It was narrow, but it took a good four to five steps to get to the far side of it. After checking out my room, I headed up to the attic. The landlord previously told me, or, sort of, warned me, not to let anyone sleep in the attic. Whether or not this has anything to do with my story, you'll have to decide. She said it gets extremely hot up there during the summer or something. I had a room, my mom had her room, so it didn't matter much. I walked upstairs to a two-roomed attic that had the door in between them removed. The first room had nothing inside, but the second had a couch sitting in the middle of it. There was nothing around it, no tables, lamps, light fixtures, or anything else. Just a dirty white couch in the middle. I decided not to mess with it or sit in it, because, seriously, would you plop down on a couch that the last tenant left in your new house? That's disgusting. Everything was sorted out and the place started to feel like home. A few months passed and some weird things started to happen. I would stay up very late, most of the time on my laptop while sitting on my bed, and on a few random nights, my closet door would swing open. Not swing open as in that creak they do in movies. I'm talking swing open like someone roundhoused it open. The first time it happened, I was scared. My bed was facing the closet, so I looked up, scared as bad, and saw, nothing. The closet door was just flat against the wall with nothing but darkness in the closet. There were no demon eyes, no shadowy figure, just darkness. I got up, closed the closet door, and went back to my laptop. This event started happening more and more frequently, and since I always had a window fan installed, I figured it was just some really strong draft. The fact that I couldn't close my closet door all the way supported my theory. The locking mechanism on it would have prevented it from swinging open like that. As I'm writing this, I just realized that I should have just put something heavy in front of it. Whatever. I told my mom about it and apologized for the noise in the middle of the night, but she said that she never heard a thing. I found it pretty odd since the door slammed pretty loudly into the wall. A little more than half a year after first moving in, we decided to move out. We found a cheaper, but smaller, apartment and decided to go with it. My friend knows people who work for a moving company, so we hired a few workers to move all our stuff out. While we were packing up all our things, I set up a radio in my room to listen to while I was busy putting everything into boxes. I went to the bathroom. And upon leaving my room, I closed my door. It wasn't by accident or anything. I just had a habit of closing doors behind me. I took a piss and went back to my room. I opened the door and stood there for a moment, closed the door, and opened it again. That's when I noticed that I can't hear anything coming from my room when the door is closed. The radio was pretty loud yet I couldn't hear even a tiny bit of it when the door was shut. This actually weirded me out more than the closet door slamming in the middle of the night because it just didn't make any sense. Then I realized that maybe that's why my mom never heard the loud slamming. Still thinking about it, I continued to pack. I went into my closet to get my clothes. I swung the closet door open and held it flat against the wall. I didn't want to keep opening and closing it as I walked in and out. But the door wouldn't stay flat against the wall. I would open it all the way, then it would creak back a bit into a 70 degree angle. This is where I started to get creeped out. All those nights that the door slammed open, it was at a complete 180. The only way it could stay like that was if someone or something held it open freaking out, 
I grabbed all my stuff in the closet ASAP and threw them onto my bed. I did not want to stand in that long, narrow closet any longer. I went up to the attic to check up on the workers. They had just finished clearing the attic and asked me about the white couch. I told them it wasn't mine and to leave it there. They shrugged, put it back down, and went downstairs. As I turned to follow them, something on the floor caught my eye, an extremely black, seemingly burned mark stuck out underneath the couch. I walked over and pushed the couch out of the way. Sitting there, at my feet, was a pentagram burned into the carpet. It was as if someone had one of those cow marker slash prodder things or whatever they're called, except it was huge and in the shape of a pentagram. I quickly called the workers back and we stared at it for the longest time. A few the F is this crap were exchanged, and then a few chuckles from them. I wasn't laughing. Especially after they pointed out that this pentagram was right above my room. I was going to go downstairs, finish packing, and get the F out of this house. As I took the last box from my room, I looked one last time at the room, at the closet, and at the paper above the door. The top right corner of the paper was falling off a little bit. I felt a deep, sudden urge to rip it off, but I denied that feeling and brought my stuff outside. It's been about three to four years since I've lived in that house, but I still think about it often. About a year ago, I went to my aunt's house for my cousin's birthday. I've been there before, but on that day I noticed something I've never noticed before. As I was taking off my shoes, I looked up. Above the door to her house, stuck in between the top of the door and the ceiling, was a very similar piece of paper. This piece was different, though, as the Chinese letters were very faint, as if it was flipped and faced the wall instead of facing me. I asked my aunt about it and she told me it was a sort of charm to keep evil spirits away. It haunts me now. What if I succumb to the urge of ripping the paper off the wall? Is that paper still there? It was peeling off the last time I saw it. Did anyone fix it? Or worse, did anyone remove it? She told me what the Chinese letters meant. Literally translated, it said no entry beyond. I asked her why she had the piece of paper flipped around, and the words she told me next will scar me forever. It's supposed to be that way. The wordings on the paper are supposed to face where evil spirits will come from. I stood there, frozen. A feeling of enormous dread swept over me. That man, that superstitious bastard of a man that lived in the house before me wasn't trying to keep evil spirits from entering that room. He was trying to keep something from leaving. About 10 years ago I was recently divorced and living alone in a one-bedroom apartment. The place was clean and the rent was decent. One of those places that had a doorman, I felt safe here. I was alone and loving it, focused on my career and not on my clingy ex-husband. Things were finally looking up for me. At the time I was working pretty late at the office and would often stumble into my apartment sleep deprived in the early hours of the morning and wake up by 6, 30, 7-ish to start the day. I started noticing that in the morning my door would be unlocked sometimes, I usually dismissed this as my sleep dead brain thinking that the bed looked more appealing than locking the door. Another thing that I noticed since moving in was that I seemed to misplace things more than I used to, little things like a hairbrush or nail polish, that sort of thing. It wasn't really that big of a deal, just enough to be a slight annoyance in my day. The longer I lived there the more frequently I seemed to forget to lock the door, at first it was every once in a while then it seemed like an almost daily occurrence. More things went missing. Things like pictures, shaving razors and most disturbingly, my underwear. This went on for long enough that I started to get a little paranoid. I started to take the time at night to make sure the door was locked, 
I got into a habit of every night after I locked the door to turn the handle three times and say to myself it's locked. It's locked. It's locked. Time after time I would wake up and the door would be unlocked. One time I even tried staying up all night to watch the door, but I ended up falling asleep in my chair. I decided that my mind was not reliable enough to stay up all night so I invested in a video camera. I went all out and bought the fanciest camera that I could get my hands on. So one night I set the camera up facing the door. I hid the camera under a pile of towels on the floor. I locked the door and went to bed. When I woke up, my apartment looked normal. Nothing missing that I could see. I decided to check the tape. I fast forwarded through hours of footage, not seeing anything. I was just about to give up when I noticed the handle of the door jitter. Then it slowly crept open. A figure slid through the half-open door. And walked towards the camera. It paused. Looked around as if it was listening for something. Then walked forward into direct view of the camera. I paused the camera. The hairs on my arms and the back of my neck started to rise. I was staring directly into the face of the maintenance man of the building. I could see those big thick glasses and curly hair. I had no doubt who it was. I played the tape a little more. He looked comfortable as he walked around the apartment. Then he turned and walked towards my bedroom and out of the view of the camera. I didn't know what to do, sobbing I called the police. I tried to explain over the phone but couldn't. Soon enough two officers arrived at my doorstep. I told them everything and showed them the tape. I remember seeing the blood drain from their faces. They promised me that I was safe, and that they were going to get this guy. I needed to lay down, but didn't want to be alone. One of the officers offered to stand outside my apartment door as I took a nap. As I was laying in bed unable to sleep but to drain to move, Something kept nagging at me. I laid there for a few minutes tossing and turning, unable to get comfortable or rest. My mind was racing. Then a realization slowly washed over me and chilled me to the bone. We watched the tape, and saw the man enter my home, but we never saw him leave. I froze, then started shaking. I needed to get to the front door. I sat up and looked around the room. I couldn't see anyone. I swung my legs over the side of the bed cautiously. My feet hit the cold wood floor and I felt warm breath on my ankles. I raced out of my apartment as fast as I could and to the safety of the police officer. He called for backup. They found the man under my bed, clutching a knife and a Polaroid camera. Russian researchers in the late 1940s kept five people awake for 15 days using an experimental gas-based stimulant. They were kept in a sealed environment to carefully monitor their oxygen intake so the gas didn't kill them, since it was toxic in high concentrations. This was before closed-circuit cameras so they had only microphones and 5-inch thick glass porthole-sized windows into the chamber to monitor them. The chamber was stocked with books, cots to sleep on but no bedding, running water and toilet, and enough dried food to last all five for over a month. The test subjects were political prisoners deemed enemies of the state during World War II. Everything was fine for the first five days. The subjects hardly complained having been promised, falsely, that they would be freed if they submitted to the test and did not sleep for 30 days. Their conversations and activities were monitored and it was noted that they continued to talk about increasingly traumatic incidents in their past, and the general tone of their conversations took on a darker aspect after the four-day mark. After five days they started to complain about the circumstances and events that lead them to where they were and started to demonstrate severe paranoia. They stopped talking to each other and began alternately whispering to the microphones and one-way mirrored portholes. Oddly they all seemed to think they could win the trust of the experimenters by turning over their comrades, 
the other subjects in captivity with them. At first the researchers suspected this was an effect of the gas itself. After nine days the first of them started screaming. He ran the length of the chamber repeatedly yelling at the top of his lungs for three hours straight, he continued attempting to scream but was only able to produce occasional squeaks. The researchers postulated that he had physically torn his vocal cords. The most surprising thing about this behavior is how the other captives reacted to it. Or rather didn't react to it. They continued whispering to the microphones until the second of the captives started to scream. The two non-screaming captives took the books apart, smeared page after page with their own feces and pasted them calmly over the glass portholes. The screaming promptly stopped. So did the whispering to the microphones. After three more days passed, the researchers checked the microphones hourly to make sure they were working, since they thought it impossible that no sound could be coming with five people inside. The oxygen consumption in the chamber indicated that all five must still be alive. In fact it was the amount of oxygen five people would consume at a very heavy level of strenuous exercise. On the morning of the 14th day the researchers did something they said they would not do to get a reaction from the captives, they used the intercom inside the chamber, hoping to provoke any response from the captives they were afraid were either dead or vegetables. They announced, we are opening the chamber to test the microphones, step away from the door and lie flat on the floor or you will be shot. Compliance will earn one of you your immediate freedom. To their surprise they heard a single phrase in a calm voice response, we no longer want to be freed. Debate broke out among the researchers and the military forces funding the research. Unable to provoke any more response using the intercom it was finally decided to open the chamber at midnight on the 15th day. The chamber was flushed of the stimulant gas and filled with fresh air and immediately voices from the microphones began to object. Three different voices began begging, as if pleading for the life of loved ones to turn the gas back on. The chamber was opened and soldiers sent in to retrieve the test subjects. They began to scream louder than ever, and so did the soldiers when they saw what was inside. Four of the five subjects were still alive, although no one could rightly call the state that any of them in life. The food rations past day five had not been so much as touched. There were chunks of meat from the dead test subjects thighs and chest stuffed into the drain in the center of the chamber, blocking the drain and allowing four inches of water to accumulate on the floor. Precisely how much of the water on the floor was actually blood was never determined. All four surviving test subjects also had large portions of muscle and skin torn away from their bodies. The destruction of flesh and exposed bone on their fingertips indicated that the wounds were inflicted by hand, not with teeth as the researchers initially thought. Closer examination of the position and angles of the wounds indicated that most if not all of them were self-inflicted. The abdominal organs below the ribcage of all four test subjects had been removed. While the heart, lungs and diaphragm remained in place, the skin and most of the muscles attached to the ribs had been ripped off, exposing the lungs through the ribcage. All the blood vessels and organs remained intact, they had just been taken out and laid on the floor, fanning out around the eviscerated but still living bodies of the subjects. The digestive tract of all four could be seen to be working, digesting food. It quickly became apparent that what they were digesting was their own flesh that they had ripped off and eaten over the course of days. Most of the soldiers were Russian special operatives at the facility, but still many refused to return to the chamber to remove the test subjects. They continued to scream to be left in the chamber and alternately begged and demanded that the gas be turned back on, lest they fall asleep. To everyone's surprise the test subjects put up a fierce fight in the process of being removed from the chamber. One of the Russian soldiers died from having his throat ripped out, another was gravely injured by having his testicles ripped off and an artery in his leg severed by one of the subject's teeth. 
Another five of the soldiers lost their lives if you count ones that committed suicide in the weeks following the incident. In the struggle one of the four living subjects had his spleen ruptured and he bled out almost immediately. The medical researchers attempted to sedate him but this proved impossible. He was injected with more than 10 times the human dose of a morphine derivative and still fought like a cornered animal, breaking the ribs and arm of one doctor. One heart was seen to beat for a full two minutes after he had bled out to the point there was more air in his vascular system than blood. Even after it stopped he continued to scream and flail for another three minutes, struggling to attack anyone in reach and just repeating the word more over and over, weaker and weaker, until he finally fell silent. The surviving three test subjects were heavily restrained and moved to a medical facility, the two with intact vocal cords continuously begging for the gas demanding to be kept awake. The most injured of the three was taken to the only surgical operating room that the facility had. In the process of preparing the subject to have his organs placed back within his body it was found that he was effectively immune to the sedative they had given him to prepare him for the surgery. He fought furiously against his restraints when the anesthetic gas was brought out to put him under. He managed to tear most of the way through a 4-inch wide leather strap on one wrist, even through the weight of a 200-pound soldier holding that wrist as well. It took only a little more anesthetic than normal to put him under, and the instant his eyelids fluttered and closed, his heart stopped. In the autopsy of the test subject that died on the operating table it was found that his blood had tripled the normal level of oxygen. His muscles that were still attached to his skeleton were badly torn and he had broken nine bones in his struggle to not be subdued. Most of them were from the force his own muscles had exerted on them. The second survivor had been the first of the group of five to start screaming. His vocal cords destroyed he was unable to beg or object to surgery, and he only reacted by shaking his head violently in disapproval when the anesthetic gas was brought near him. He shook his head yes when someone suggested, reluctantly, they try the surgery without anesthetic and did not react for the entire six-hour procedure of replacing his abdominal organs and attempting to cover them with what remained of his skin. The surgeon presiding stated repeatedly that it should be medically possible for the patient to still be alive. One terrified nurse assisting the surgery stated that she had seen the patient's mouth curl into a smile several times, whenever his eyes met hers. When the surgery ended the subject looked at the surgeon and began to wheeze loudly, attempting to talk while struggling. Assuming this must be something of drastic importance the surgeon had a pen and pad fetched so the patient could write his message. It was simple. Keep cutting. The other two test subjects were given the same surgery, both without anesthetic as well. Although they had to be injected with a paralytic for the duration of the operation. The surgeon found it impossible to perform the operation while the patients laughed continuously. Once paralyzed the subjects could only follow the attending researchers with their eyes. The paralytic cleared their system in an abnormally short period of time and they were soon trying to escape their bonds. The moment they could speak they were again asking for the stimulant gas. The researchers tried asking why they had injured themselves why they had ripped out their own guts and why they wanted to be given the gas again. Only one response was given, I must remain awake. All three subjects' restraints were reinforced and they were placed back into the chamber awaiting determination as to what should be done with them. The researchers, facing the wrath of their military benefactors for having failed the stated goals of their project considered euthanizing the surviving subjects. The commanding officer, an ex-KGB instead saw potential, and wanted to see what would happen if they were put back on the gas. The researchers strongly objected, but were overruled. In preparation for being sealed in the chamber again the subjects were connected to an EAT monitor and had their restraints padded for long-term confinement. To everyone's surprise all three stopped struggling the moment it was let slip that they were going back on the gas. 
It was obvious that at this point all three were putting up a great struggle to stay awake. One of subjects that could speak was humming loudly and continuously. The mute subject was straining his legs against the leather bonds with all his might, first left, then right, then left again for something to focus on. The remaining subject was holding his head off his pillow and blinking rapidly. Having been the first to be wired for EEG most of the researchers were monitoring his brain waves in surprise. They were normal most of the time but sometimes flatlined inexplicably. It looked as if he were repeatedly suffering brain death, before returning to normal. As they focused on paper scrolling out of the brainwave monitor only one nurse saw his eyes slip shut at the same moment his head hit the pillow. His brainwaves immediately changed to that of deep sleep, then flatlined for the last time as his heart simultaneously stopped. The only remaining subject that could speak started screaming to be sealed in now. His brainwaves showed the same flatlines as one who had just died from falling asleep. The commander gave the order to seal the chamber with both subjects inside, as well as three researchers. One of the named three immediately drew his gun and shot the commander point blank between the eyes, then turned the gun on the mute subject and blew his brains out as well. He pointed his gun at the remaining subject, still restrained to a bed as the remaining members of the medical and research team fled the room. I won't be locked in here with these things. Not with you. He screamed at the man strapped to the table. What are you? He demanded. I must know. The subject smiled. Have you forgotten so easily? The subject asked. We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis when you go to the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. The researcher paused then aimed at the subject's heart and fired. The eag flatlined as the subject weakly choked out, so, nearly, free. A girl in her teens gets called upon to babysit some kids on a Friday evening. Apparently she watches those two girls pretty regularly. Anyway the parents leave for the evening and said they wouldn't be home until around midnight. The teenager puts the two young girls to bed around 9 p.m. She does what most people would do, goes downstairs and watches TV for a while. She watches TV for an hour or so, and by this point it's getting pretty late. She's in the living room on the main level, the TV sits in the corner of the room, with large windows on each side of it. Suddenly, she out of the corner of her eye sees what she thinks is someone walking by the window outside through the bushes. Naturally she gets pretty freaked out. She ends up calling 911, and the police arrive. The police check outside, don't find any signs of anyone walking around I guess it was winter with snow on the ground. The police officers assure her she's safe and that the lighting from both the TV and lamp probably played tricks on her by reflecting off the window. The teen agrees that's probably what it was, yet asks them to check inside the house for her just to be safe. The police reluctantly oblige and start randomly checking rooms, closets, and the garage a bit haphazardly. They roll their eyes a bit as they wonder how much this girl's imagination has run wild. Well, turns out they find a man hiding underneath one of the little girl's beds. I guess as the story goes it was the little girl's mother's ex-husband. The babysitter didn't see someone walk past the window outside. What she saw was the reflection of him walking behind the couch. A man is driving a regular route along the highway when he notices a turnoff that will take him up through the mountains. He figures he drives this way all the time, but has never taken the mountain path even though it will only take him a few hours longer to reach his destination. As a spur of the moment decision, he take the turn and begins his journey up the winding road. 
He'd started his drive later in the day than usual so the sky is getting dark as he approaches the top, but the view is gorgeous. While he continues, he gets a small chill up the base of his neck, but dismisses it as the cool mountain air. Not long after, he has to slow his car as he approaches what appears to be a nasty car accident. Two cars completely totaled, looking like they hit each other head on just after rounding a corner. The man can see a few bodies on the ground, all bloodied and not moving. Immediately he knows he has to pull over and help, but he can't stop some sixth sense telling him something about the scene is wrong. Like it isn't natural. He decides he's going to drive his car forward and park it just beyond the crash site before getting out to help. He slowly creeps by the wreck and manages a better look at one of the bodies, it's definitely human but something seems amiss but he still can't place it. He rolls the car forward maybe 6 meters from the crash site, as he's about to come to a stop and open his door to investigate, he looks out his front windshield for a moment. It's gotten terribly dark now, nearly pitch black, when something in his rear view mirror catches the eye. Several somethings in fact. As he gazes into the mirror in horror, he can see the bodies of the crash site illuminated by his rear lights. All of them are sitting up, staring directly at his car, eyes like glowing orbs in the mirror. He panics as suddenly more people come out from the ditches and forests surrounding the road, but only when the crash victim bodies begin to stand, seemingly fine, no limps or dragging themselves, does he have the presence of mind to throw the car back into drive. By the time the first people are taking careful steps toward the vehicle, he's already speeding as fast as he can around the bend and getting the hell of the mountain. Nothing ever came for him, nor did it seem he was ever followed. Sometimes he wonders if his mind played a trick on him, but he still to this day, he always checks his rear view mirror before ever stepping out of the car. I was out hunting in Northern Ontario, no roads, except for a logging roads, within 130 kilometers. I was late on the bear season so no one was out hunting in my quadrant. I found a nice campsite alongside a river and hunted from there. On the second day of my hunt I came across the bear tracks I tracked it for about two hours, and then turned around. This is when thing got very weird. I always track on one side of the tracks and return on the other. About 200 meters down the east side of the tracks I ran into another human footprint which disappeared across the trail and into the woods on the west. My dog, Czech wolf dog, didn't seem to smell anything, so I returned to camp with minimal concern. I got back to camp at around 7.30 at night made a quick dinner and had a cigar by the camp. At around 12. Oh oh I heard a snap of a branch, after hunting for 20 years only two things snap branches, bears, and humans. I grabbed my firearm and a flashlight and went out after the noise. Every 100 yards, I would scan with the flashlight. My dog freaked, started growling and advancing into the woods slowly, I pulled back on my leash to slow his advance and switched on my flashlight. I saw a pair of eyes looking right back at me, it stared for about 5 seconds and disappeared into the woods. On the walk back I felt anxious, scared, and uncomfortable I could feel someone watching me. The next night, the same thing happened. My dog went wild, like I have never seen him he was whimpering, growling, and clearly very anxious. At this point I was terrified. I didn't go hunting that day and didn't close my eyes once. That night I sat up with my flashlight, constantly scanning the tree line. I guess I dozed of it around 1 and woke again at 3, I was sweating, confused, and very scared. I scanned the forest, and just barely visible about 25 yards in the forest there was a man and his dog, he was looking right back at me. I stared to approach him shouting to him. I got within 10 feet, he looked awfully disheveled and stank, 
The worst part was that he just stared and smiled his eyes showed zero emotion and whispered good night. I ran back to my tent, packed it into my pack and loaded it onto the trailer of the ATV and drove out of there. Edit. I didn't realize that this wasn't going to get buried, I would have spent more time on the story, and not rushed it. I left out the very last part where I had to look for my keys at the car for a solid 25 minutes at 4 in the morning. Thanks for the compliments on the story. It was definitely a terrifying point in my life. This story was told to me by my great aunt, one of my grandmother's nine sisters. In Cuba, where we're all from, the summers tend to get hot. Coupled with the lack of air conditioning, you'd have to be wealthy to own a unit. People tend to sleep with doors and windows open. One night, my aunt T was putting her grandchildren to sleep. She laid in bed with them, and they were alone in the home. One of her sisters, Berta, was supposed to be keeping them company tonight, but some last-minute event made her change where she slept that night. My aunt T says that sometime around 9 p.m. she noticed a figure who, by her description, must have been seven feet fall. It was human-shaped, but seemed to float inside their home. If it had legs, they weren't visible because a long robe of some sort covered them and dragged along her floor. At this point, rather than scream in fear, my Aunt T decides to lay perfectly still so as to not wake the children. She sees the figure cross the hallway, and head into her room, looming ominously over them. The face, she described, was that of a pale woman, with big red lips and her hair in dreads like that of a Rastafarian man. There were just shadows, cavities as she called it where her eyes would have been. It left her room through the same way it entered, but didn't leave. My aunt's house is large, and she swears she saw the figure go in and out of each room, take about the same amount of time, then leave. Eventually she ran out of places to in the home to visit, and simply glided out the front door. My aunt cries to this very day because, the next morning, her sister Berta was found dead. Everyone thought it must have been some sort of heart attack or stroke in her sleep because no one heard anything, and they found her where she had laid the night before, only lifeless. My aunt swears the thing must have been death itself, searching for her sister where she should have been. A hunter is lost in the woods at night, and has nothing useful to survive. He arrives in a glade and in the middle of it, stands a wood cabin. Scared but tired and despaired for shelter, he goes and tries to open the door. It's unlocked. Inside, he founds a table, a candle and matches, a small bed. He light the candle, looks around and stops in shock. Around him, dozens of paintings of menacing, angry faces looking at him are hanging at the wall. He tries not to look at them, gets in the bed and falls asleep. He wakes up the next morning to the sun on his face. How is it possible? He thinks. I didn't see any windows last night. He looks around, only to see that the paintings were not, in fact, paintings. They were windows. My cousin was in a band and did some touring for a while. He ran into another band, from the Illinois area, that had a creepy story to tell. They spent their days on the road and didn't make a lot of money so they always depended on fans to find places to stay. After playing a show there was a particular fan who seemed really interested. He offered them a place to stay. His parents were really involved in their church and absent from the house. The band members were kind of curious about this so they asked him if his parents were on a mission. He just kind of awkwardly smiled and didn't answer the question. Later that night the band members were getting hungry and thought about raiding the guy's fridge. However, they decided since he was being such a good host that they didn't want to be rude. 
A few days later they saw a story on the news about a guy who killed his parents, chopped them up, and put them in his freezer. The guy who was arrested under suspicion was the guy they had stayed with. His parents were in the freezer when they talked about raiding the fridge. This was told to me by my aunt. My apologies for any lack of detail, as my grandmother died years before I was born. And also, I don't know how true this is. First off, my mother was one of 10 children. When she was a teen, her parents and half her siblings moved to the east. My aunts and uncles have told me that something was strange around that house. They would hear voices, running upstairs when no one was there, a rocking chair would rock when no one was in it, and so on. Eventually, my grandmother was diagnosed with brain cancer. She was in her bed at home recuperating from her most recent surgery and my aunt was there alone taking care of her. My grandmother was completely bed bound at this point, it was impossible for her to walk. She had a funny tendency to blot at her healing incisions on her scalp with tissues, which is kinda not so great for them. Because of this the tissue box was kept across the room from her bed. My aunt brought in my grandmother's lunch on a tray and set it down on my grandmother's lap. My grandmother asked her or the tissues for her head and my aunt reminded her that she was not supposed to do that. My grandmother then asked for a drink. My aunt went to the kitchen and brought back her drink when she sees her mother with the tissues, still in bed, blotting her head. My aunt takes them away and again reminds her that she shouldn't do that. This is when she realizes that my grandmother cannot get out of bed, so she asks, Mom, how did you even get these? My grandmother replied, Oh, that little girl that always follows you around gave them to me. Last year I worked with a guy who'd spent some time on oil rigs in the North Sea. He told me that there was a real huge storm, pounded the place, that happened all the time there. In the morning they had to assess the damage, and they saw that there's this platform down by the water that was partially submerged, normally it's just above the waterline. So being low guy on the totem pole he went down first and he told me that the whole thing was a death trap the platform barely hanging on. He told me that he got to the bottom where the rest was in the water and just as soon as he stepped on it into the water it started sinking fast, he had to run up the stairs and when he got to the landing above the whole thing under him just broke off and sank. But what got me is when he said that it wasn't like it just sank. It was like the metal was pulled until it broke. Like something big grabbed it from underneath and pulled it down. And whatever it was only did that when he stepped into that water. Like it had been a trap. He told me after that they kept getting damage they couldn't explain, metal ladders broke and pipes sheared off. Always during storms. Sometimes guys went missing which was the worst. He told me that they told the media that they had to evacuate the place because of some kind of leak but that was the real reason and eventually the whole place was going to go down. And he said the same thing had happened to other places in the North Sea. F if I know if he was lying but I thought it was creepy. My friend was almost a victim of a killing. So, here's a story of my friend. He lives in an apartment complex in the city. The place is 10 stories high, and he lives on the 8th. One night he was going home and arrived at the main lobby at around 11 p.m. He waited for the elevator and when the door opened, a man rudely bumped into him and hurriedly walked out of the lobby. My friend didn't think much of it, until he got back to his room. As he looked into his bathroom mirror to brush his teeth, he found bits of blood on the very shoulder the man had bumped. The next day was a Saturday, and he was getting ready for a date. He had just taken a shower when he heard a knock on the door. Peering through the eye hole, he saw a policeman. 
The policeman was a guy in his mid-40s, with short dark hair, with a shaved off left eyebrow. The policeman asked through the door, there was a murder last night at around 10. 50 p.m. and I would like to ask if you saw anything in particular. My friend did see something in particular. He bumped into a man that bloodied his shoulder. But he replied no sir, I know nothing of the sort. My friend was already late for his date and didn't want to get involved. The policeman responded all right, thank you for your time, and left. My friend went to his date and came back home later that day feeling a bit guilty. He lied to a police officer. Then he flicked on the TV, and the news was talking about the murder at his apartment. Great, he thought, way to make me feel more guilty. But then, the news went on to say that the killer was caught. The culprit's photo came on the screen. And there the murderer was. A guy in his mid-40s, with short dark hair, with a shaved off left eyebrow. He wasn't a police officer. He was a man who was out to kill the witnesses. Forgive me if I get this wrong, it is a true story I read a while ago that made my blood run cold. A Redditor was remembering her childhood, she and her brother were playing in the home her mother and aunt in the kitchen making lunch. As the kids were running around the house playing, the girl sees an old woman sitting in the living room. The old woman looks up at the girl and smiles, and the girl can still hear her mother in the kitchen, her brother playing outside. The old woman, still smiling beckons the girl over to her chair and says, Sweetie, your mother is very tired of taking care of you. She is tired and sick of having you around the house. Nobody here wants or loves you, and you have to come with me. You are going to live with me now. The old woman reaches out to grab the girl's arm, when the mother calls from the kitchen. The girl runs into the kitchen and tells her mom in tears about the old woman in the living room. They go look and the woman is gone. This happened to me, and it still freaks me out when I'm home alone. When I was 16 a few summers ago, my parents went out for the day and my sister left to go out too. I live in an average small suburban neighborhood. I was stuck in the house bored with my dog with nobody else home. It was really hot in the living room, so I turned on the air conditioner. For that to happen I need to open the garage door because the butt of the air conditioner faces in there and the garage gets overheated. Usually when we do this we lock the garage door that leads into the living room, but this one time I forgot. I sat down on the in my room and relaxed, not thinking much of it. Bad idea. A few hours later in the afternoon, I hear my dog barking like a maniac. I almost ignored it but went into the living room and heard the doorknob on the garage door jiggling. I assumed that my sister came home, so I yelled it's not locked. She didn't respond back, the doorknob jiggled more violently. I walked in and went to the door, yelling again it's not L when the door opened. It felt like slow motion, the door creaked open a sliver of a crack and that's all I needed to see. I just saw the feet. Huge dark brown hiking boots of a man. Not my sister. I immediately pushed on the door to close it again and started screaming slash crying hysterically. I'm a small girl but I struggled to push it shut and locked it. He started pounding on the door, but then it stopped. Hysterically crying and screaming, I scooped up my dog and ran into the kitchen to get a knife. When I went in the kitchen I heard the gate in the backyard open and quick footsteps down the cement path. Like in the horror movies, with tears streaming down my face I screamed no. Dog in one hand and knife in the other, I threw the knife on the floor and ran to lock the back door. When I quickly bent down on the kitchen floor to pick up the knife, my legs were shaking from being so scared. My weak legs gave out and I fell forward almost onto my face. 
I tried to scramble to my feet but ended up crawling and tripping on the kitchen floor, and I accidentally scratched a long shallow cut on my bare foot with the knife. I hid under the dining room table and said my prayers. I thought this was it, this is how I'm going to die. Here in the quiet empty house with my dog as a witness. I held my mouth to cover my crying when I heard footsteps approach the back door. My heart was racing a million beats a minute and I had the knife tightly clenched in my hand as I waited for him to make his next move. I saw his shadow through the blinds looking into the window, he stood there for a while and then walked out. The police never found him. To this day I always make sure the door is locked when the garage door is open, I don't know what would have happened if my dog didn't bark and alert me that there was a man trying to break in. I would have been in my room completely unaware until it was too late. Edit. When I was 16 years old, a man tried to break into my house while I was home alone. I basically invited him inside because I thought it was my sister. I just want to start off by saying if you want an answer at the end, prepare to be disappointed. There just isn't one. I was an intern at Nickelodeon Studios for a year in 2005 for my degree in animation. It wasn't paid of course, most internships aren't, but it did have some perks beyond education. To adults it might not seem like a big one, but most kids at the time would poo themselves over it. Now, since I worked directly with the editors and animators, I got to view the new episodes days before they aired. I'll get right to it without giving too many unnecessary details. They had very recently made the Spongebob movie and the entire staff was somewhat sapped of creativity so it took them longer to start up the season. But the delay lasted longer for more upsetting reasons. There was a problem with the series 4 premiere that set everyone and everything back for several months. Me and two other interns were in the editing room along with the lead animators and sound editors for the final cut. We received the copy that was supposed to be fear of a Krabby Patty and gathered around the screen to watch. Now, given that it isn't final yet animators often put up a mock title card, sort of an inside joke for us, with phony, oftentimes lewd titles, such as how sex doesn't work instead of rock a bye bye valve when Spongebob and Patrick adopt a sea scallop. Nothing particularly funny but work-related chuckles. So when we saw the title card Squidward we didn't think it more than a morbid joke. One of the interns did a small throat laugh at it. The happy-go-lucky music plays as is normal. The story began with Squidward practicing his clarinet, hitting a few sour notes like normal. We hear Spongebob laughing outside and Squidward stops, yelling at him to keep it down as he has a concert that night and needs to practice. Spongebob says okay and goes to see Sandy with Patrick. The bubbles splash screen comes up and we see the ending of Squidward's concert. This is when things began to seem off. While playing, a few frames repeat themselves, but the sound doesn't, at this point sound is synced up with animation, so, yes, that's not common, but when he stops playing, the sound finishes as if the skip never happened. There is slight murmuring in the crowd before they begin to boo him. Not normal cartoon booing that is common in the show, but you could very clearly hear malice in it. Squidward's in full frame and looks visibly afraid. The shot goes to the crowd, with Spongebob in center frame, and he too is booing, very much unlike him. That isn't the oddest thing, though. What is odd is everyone had hyper-realistic eyes. Very detailed. Clearly not shots of real people's eyes, but something a bit more real than CGI. The pupils were red. Some of us looked at each other, obviously confused, but since we weren't the writers, we didn't question its appeal to children yet. The shot goes to Squidward sitting on the edge of his bed, looking very forlorn. The view out of his porthole window is of a night sky so it isn't very long after the concert. 
The unsettling part is at this point there is no sound. Literally no sound. Not even the feedback from the speakers in the room. It's as if the speakers were turned off, though their status showed them working perfectly. He just sat there, blinking, in this silence for about 30 seconds, then he started to sob softly. He put his hands, tentacles, over his eyes and cried quietly for a full minute more, all the while a sound in the background very slowly growing from nothing to barely audible. It sounded like a slight breeze through a forest. The screen slowly begins to zoom in on his face. By slow I mean it's only noticeable if you look at shots 10 seconds apart side by side. His sobbing gets louder, more full of hurt and anger. The screen then twitches a bit, as if it twists in on itself, for a split second then back to normal. The wind through the trees sound gets slowly louder and more severe, as if a storm is brewing somewhere. The eerie part is this sound, and Squidward sobbing, sounded real, as if the sound wasn't coming from the speakers but as if the speakers were holes the sound was coming through from the other side. As good a sound as the studio likes to have, they don't purchase the equipment to be that good to produce sound of that quality. Below the sound of the wind and sobbing, very faint, something sounded like laughing. It came at odd intervals and never lasted more than a second so you had a hard time pinning it. We watched this show twice, so pardon me if things sound too specific but I've had time to think about them. After 30 seconds of this, the screen blurred and twitched violently and something flashed over the screen, as if a single frame was replaced. The lead animation editor paused and rewound frame by frame. What we saw was horrible. It was a still photo of a dead child. He couldn't have been more than six. The face was mangled and bloodied, one eye dangling over his upturned face, popped. He was naked down to his underwear, his stomach crudely cut open and his entrails laying beside him. He was laying on some pavement that was probably a road. The most upsetting part was that there was a shadow of the photographer. There was no crime tape, no evidence tags or markers, and the angle was completely off for a shot designed to be evidence. It would seem the photographer was the person responsible for the child's death. We were of course mortified, but pressed on, hoping that it was just a sick joke. The screen flipped back to Squidward, still sobbing, louder than before, and half body in frame. There was now what appeared to be blood running down his face from his eyes. The blood was also done in a hyper-realistic style looking as if you touched it you'd get blood on your fingers. The wind sounded now as if it were that of a gale blowing through the forest. There were even snapping sounds of branches. The laughing, a deep baritone, lasting at longer intervals and coming more frequently. After about 20 seconds, the screen again twisted and showed a single frame photo. The editor was reluctant to go back, we all were, but he knew he had two. This time the photo was that of what appeared to be a little girl, no older than the first child. She was laying on her stomach, her barrettes in a pool of blood next to her. Her left eye was too popped out and popped, naked except for underpants. Her entrails were piled on top of her above another crude cut along her back. Again the body was on the street and the photographer's shadow was visible, very similar in size and shape to the first. I had to choke back vomit and one in turn, the only female in the room, ran out. The show resumed. About five seconds after this second photo played, Squidward went silent, as did all sound, like it was when this scene started. He put his tentacles down and his eyes were now done in hyper-realism like the others were in the beginning of this episode. They were bleeding, bloodshot, and pulsating. He just stared at the screen, as if watching the viewer. After about 10 seconds, he started sobbing, this time not covering his eyes. The sound was piercing and loud, and most fear-inducing of all as his sobbing was mixed with screams. 
Tears and blood were dripping down his face at a heavy rate. The wind sound came back, and so did the deep voice laughing, and this time the still photo lasted for a good five frames. The animator was able to stop it on the fourth and backed up. This time the photo was of a boy, about the same age, but this time the scene was different. The entrails were just being pulled out from a stomach wound by a large hand, the right eye popped and dangling, blood trickling down it. The animator proceeded. It was hard to believe, but the next one was different, but we couldn't tell what. He went on to the next, same thing. He went back to the first and played them quicker and I lost it. I vomited on the floor, the animating and sound editors gasping at the screen. The five frames were not as if they were five different photos, they were played out as if they were frames from a video. We saw the hand slowly lift out the guts, we saw the kid's eyes focus on it, we even saw two frames of the kid beginning to blink. The lead sound editor told us to stop, he had to call in the creator to see this. Mr. Hillenberg arrived within about 15 minutes. He was confused as to why he was called down there, so the editor just continued the episode. Once the few frames were shown, all screaming, all sound again stopped. Squidward was just staring at the viewer, full frame of the face, for about three seconds. The shot quickly panned out and that deep voice said do it and we see in Squidward's hands a shotgun. He immediately puts the gun in his mouth and pulls the trigger. Realistic blood and brain matter splatters the wall behind him, and his bed, and he flies back with the force. The last five seconds of this episode show his body on the bed, on his side, one eye dangling on what's left of his head above the floor, staring blankly at it. Then the episode ends. Mr. Hillenberg is obviously angry at this. He demanded to know what the hell was going on. Most people left the room at this point, so it was just a handful of us to watch it again. Viewing the episode twice only served to imprint the entirety of it in my mind and caused me horrible nightmares. I'm sorry I stayed. The only theory we could think of was the file was edited by someone in the chain from the drawing studio to here. The CTO was called in to analyze when it happened. The analysis of the file did show it was edited over by new material. However, the timestamp of it was a mere 24 seconds before we began viewing it. All equipment involved was examined for foreign software and hardware as well as glitches, as if the timestamp may have glitched and showed the wrong time, but everything checked out fine. We don't know what happened and to this day nobody does. There was an investigation due to the nature of the photos, but nothing came of it. No child scene was identified and no clues were gathered from the data involved nor physical clues in the photos. I never believed in unexplainable phenomena before, but now that I have something happen and can't prove anything about it beyond anecdotal evidence, I think twice about things. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.